investors' business. They were getting lots and lots of converts. Uh, many of the, you know, just the ordinary rabble of creationists out there thought these were great ideas, loved the book, and this became sort of the accepted wisdom in many among many creationists in the United States. And they thought it was so powerful that they were pretty confident that they were going to win the next court trial, which was in 1987, uh, a case called Edwards versus Aguilar that went to the Supreme Court, where they thought, hey, we're going to finally get the right to produce textbooks that endorse scientific creationism and get those in the public schools. They were crushed when they lost their court case. They did not win the Supreme Court case, uh, and they had to go back to square one, and uh, they were very angry about this, as you might guess. They'd actually been busy preparing a grand textbook that was going to be used in their work. Uh, and then what happened is they had to re-strategize. They had to come up with a new idea, a new way to get this in the schools, and that's where this little concept that just comes out of nowhere in the middle there, intelligent design, or ID for short, came from. Uh, Philip Johnson proposed that, we, uh, that they ought to attack the source of science altogether. He's greatly opposed to methodological and metaphysical naturalism. He wants those removed from science. And he invented this field called intelligent design, which is simply uh, the old creationism with all the religious parts removed. It's a superficial veneer that they could paint over uh, the old school creationism. Uh, this has also gone to trial. In 2005, there was a trial of Kitzmiller versus Dover, uh, which some of you may have heard about, and I actually recommend get on the web and find the trial transcripts and find the, uh, the uh, judge's final decision, because it's a spectacular put down of intelligent design creationism. So it got squelched there as well. So these have gone down in defeat in the courts, but they have not gone, gone down to defeat in public opinion. So they're still floating around, and they're still gaining strength. In particular, I'll mention that these, these what I'm calling the literalists out there, although of course what they're, what they're espousing is a literal interpretation, which is two words that don't really fit well together, but their literal interpretation is six day creation, seventh day rested, flood in 2348 BC, et cetera. That's their specific interpretation, and they are really dominant right now. Who's heard of the Creation Museum in Kentucky? Yeah. Yes, this, if you ever go to Kentucky, you should visit it. It's, it's very entertaining. Uh, this is a fantastically elaborate museum, a $27 million building uh, that is dedicated entirely to this specific literalist idea of creation. That's the whole museum. Is it's pushing this. It's saying the world is not millions of years old. It's 6,000 years old, and that's it. Well, they're growing. They've got lots of money. If you go to Answers in Genesis, you can find all the, all the stuff. They, they've got all these displays. Now, I just want to show you one here. Uh, this is uh, a, an important dichotomy that they emphasize over and over again. This is just one display they have. And what they say is that there are two things in opposition. Human reason versus God's word. Which one are you going to accept? And, of course, they tell you all these things like if you accept God's word, you're going to go to hell and the world is going to fall apart and your children will do drugs and become pro prostitutes. Okay, that's their story. And if you accept God's word, uh, you're going to go to heaven and everything will be wonderful and your children will be obedient and strong and healthy. Uh, that's the entire premise of the museum. You go through this and it goes over and over and over again. And they have these nice diagrams. With, that's the evolutionary story on the left. Over there on the right is what they say has happened. All these kinds were independently created, and there was a global flood. That's that white line there. And that's where we lost a whole bunch, and then they radiated out a little bit more. Uh, so that's the model that they're pushing. So that's pretty crazy. That doesn't fit the scientific evidence at all. I also want to give you another example of creationist thought here. Uh, this, one, this one is bizarre. But uh, there is a fellow named Ray Comfort, Again, who's heard of Ray Comfort? A few of you. Yeah, you ought to look up his banana story sometime. Uh, I'm not going to show you his banana story. I'm going to show you something else that he wrote, uh, which will marvel you. It will just be marvelous. Uh, this is a guy who pretends to be a Darwin scholar who knows a lot about evolution. And, and this is what he wrote. I'll just, I'll just sit silently and let you read this for a moment.
what I mean. You know, people say I've got a sense of humor. It's not true. I just have great source material. Um, yeah, this is, this is a guy who is seriously arguing that Darwin specifically said that human males and females evolved independently. That Darwin claimed that males and females evolved independently and alongside each other for millions of years without doing it. <laughs> and he's also saying that, he, that Darwin said that they didn't do this do the act because they didn't have genitals and they reproduced by fishing. I dare anyone to go in any of Darwin's letters, any of his writings, find Darwin's claiming anything close to this. <coughs> but this is the kind of lunacy that we're dealing with, is people who feel free to make up total nonsense, stuff that makes absolutely no sense, ascribe that to evolutionary biologists and say this is the way it works. Okay, I don't want to deal too much with this level of, of crazy. I do on the blog. Yeah, feel free. Read the blog anytime, and you'll find lots of examples of this kind of thing. Uh, I'm going to deal with an argument that, that some people try to take seriously, and this is an argument that comes from uh, the intelligent design creationists. The intelligent design creationists, when you listen to their lectures, when you read their books, what you find, and what I, what I claimed uh, in a lecture earlier this year, was that it all boils down to one argument, one set of claims. And, and here I'll give it to you. This is, this is their logic. They say that complexity can only be created by design. That is, any complexity you find in the natural world has to be the product of someone intentionally planning it and generating it. That random processes, that natural processes cannot generate information or complexity. So that's, that's their fundamental premise. And then what they point out is something we all agree with. Biology is complex. And all the biologists will agree with this. And in fact, biologists provide great source material for them because what they will do is they'll write whole books which are cribbed largely from biology textbooks where they recite all this stuff that scientists have published, which, yes, shows that cell biology is incredibly complex. There's all kinds of stuff going on in your cell. It's an amazing little machine. And then they draw the conclusion from this. Well, if, if complexity can only be created by design and biology is complex, then biology was created by design, and we're done. <laughs> okay, well, I, like I said, I gave a talk about this earlier, earlier this year at the uh, Atheist Alliance International Conference, and this was recorded on YouTube. You can go on YouTube and you can find me talking about this stuff there, too. And uh, the funny thing is, it outraged a lot of creationists. And they said, no, this is not true. This is not the argument we make. And they wouldn't tell me what their actual argument was, but there, there was a lot of insistence that, that I had caricatured and simplified them too much. And one of the things they told me you have to do is go out and read the latest book from the, in, the Discovery Institute, the Intelligent Design Group in Seattle. And they told me you have to read this book, Signature in the Cell, by Stephen Meyer. <coughs> this was bad news because this book is 500 some pages long. And it's, I wouldn't exactly say it's very poorly written, but it's kind of painful to read because the author is con busy slapping himself on the back every page about how wonderful and intelligent he is, and it just makes you want to throw this book out. Anyway, uh, this book is a very thorough introduction to the concepts of intelligent design. And I'm saying that in a somewhat ironic sense, because although it is very thorough, there's not much to it. Uh, I, I can summarize the entire book for you, and here, here's, here's a summary. Uh, complexity can only be created by <laughs> Biology is complex, and therefore biology was created by design. It's, it's the whole book. Uh, as I've already said, biologists don't argue with point number two up there, right? We all agree, biology is really complicated, and if any of you are biology majors, and are struggling in your classes, you'll say, yes, it really is. It's, it's terrible. Uh, and we'll agree that if that logic were true, then that final conclusion is, is accurate. So I don't think I need to argue the last two points. Uh, the problem comes with that first one. Can complexity only be created by design? Uh, 